Welcome to my Texas workshop. I'm Randy Lammers. I'm Aaron Keevan. This is Worth Knowing. Today we start our series on structural bolting. What is the correct way to assemble bridges, high-rise buildings, towers, bolts that hold the world together? Let me introduce our guest, Chris Tribble from Worth Construction Services. Chris, welcome to the Texas Workshop. I'm glad to be here. Thanks so much for having me. All right, today, my friends, this is going to be a lot of specifications and a lot of detail, but we're gonna have some fun doing it. Now, we're starting with what is a, a specification for structural connections done by the RCSC. So, Chris, who's the RCSC? RCSC is the Research Council on Structural Connections, and they've put this specification together for use of high-strength bolts. Mm -hmm. We've got a hard copy here, but it's available as a free download on their website at boltcouncil.org. And it's a living document, so there may be some changes and updates. It's on a schedule like every other specification, but always check there first to make sure that you have a copy on your site so everything gets done as it should. Okay, let's reiterate that is, they're an organization that is .org, not .com. Yes, sir, okay. boltcouncil.org. Important to know. All right, let's start with the steel itself. Yes, sir. And I know you've got a couple of pieces over here, so let's start with that. So I understand it comes plain steel, we see it hot dip galvanized, and we see painted. Yes, so sir. So what, what do we have going on with the steel structure itself, and what's the important things to know about that? So for use with all of our structural connections, it's mm -hmm. gonna be a steel to steel connection. Right. No gaskets, no wood, no plastics. It's always gonna be steel to steel. And when we reference fang surfaces, what we're talking about is really where these two piles come together. All right. With all structural bolting, the bolt's not bringing the steel together. It's just putting the load on after the load's been distributed to the steel. So in any connection, we're gonna start with the spud wrench and we're gonna align the holes. Because again, we're not gonna use the bolt to bring the steel together. We wanna make sure that it's where it is and we can let that clamp load come on. All right. The big things we're looking for with, with the steel connections is the forces that are on it. Right. There's a shear force where this, this plate wants to go down and it's gonna separate and kind of shear off your bolt. Yeah. Okay, all the, right. The complex load is that it's wanting to go down and it's also wanting to separate where these two pieces come apart. Okay. And then last is gonna be that tension only where it's just trying to separate because of the forces that are acting on it. So three different force directions that we need to know what we're dealing with. Absolutely, and that really comes in the design phase. Okay. Designing what kind of connection that you're using and how you're doing it. The most important thing with these connections, and again, it goes back to design, is we wanna make sure that we have bare steel working with each other. Right. And when you're using a hot dip connection, that mm -hmm. hot dip actually adds a little bit of surface to it that helps keep everything in place. Okay. If you're painting, the last thing you wanna do is have paint on your connection. Because right. if you put that paint together, that paint's not nearly as strong as the steel, and that's gonna get where you get your slip. So make sure that if you have painted, you clear off around the bolt hole. Right. At least the diameter okay. of your bolt, or one inch, whichever's greater. Okay, so no overspray. If it's painted, that has to be taken off. Absolutely. Okay. I have, like I said, I've been reading the book, and this is the 2020 version. Yes, and I understand also from the American Galvanizing Association that there's been a little bit change on how to have galvanize on this, that you used to have to wire brush around the hole for hot dip galvanized, and they're saying you no longer have to do that. No longer necessary, because again, that galvanized is gonna give you a little bit more surface area okay. so, that the, so that your connection can stay together. Okay, so they've proven that to be acceptable. All right, that's why we say always go to the website and make sure you're reading the latest version of that. All right, so bolting. All right, that's our steel, and that's what we do with the different finishes on the steel. Now we got an array of bolting, but this is pretty much it, isn't it? Yes, sir. So one of the benefits of the structural bolting is there's not a whole lot of options. You basically have three strength groups, which is the 120 KSI group, mm -hmm. the 144 KSI group, and the 150 KSI group. Now those have some more common names. You may hear A325 or 1852. Right. Those are both that 120 KSI group. And then A490 or 2280, 
That's your 150 KSI group, and everything is graded on strength. Okay. Now, this is uh, what you're referring to as ASTM specifications. Told you this is going to be pretty spec heavy. So, ASTM specifications, and what Chris just mentioned is an ASTM F3125. All of those other specs are written within that specification. So, be familiar with that. So there's some things that uh, we can and cannot do, uh, and there's, their size really only goes down to about half inch diameter. Yes, sir. So per that F3125 specification, and fortunately all of this is available for the RCSC website or the ASTM 3125. Okay. Uh, half inch through inch and a half, kind of inclusive in that area, okay. that's what's gonna fall under 3125. Okay. If you go less than a half or more than an inch and a half, there's some similar properties that you can do, but it's not really gonna be what, what's called true structural bolting. Okay. I wanna also go back and reiterate, uh, Chris, what you were saying about the uh, 120, 144, and 150 KSI. That refers to the tensile strength of these bolts. And so, in other words, when you're pulling these bolts, it's that tensile strength. So the 120 group, that's 120,000 PSI tensile strength. To the 150 group, it's 150,000 PSI tensile strength. So that's what that refers to. Make sure you do that. Yes, All right, so our bolts are A325, they're A490, based on whether or not they're 120 KSI or 150 KSI. They're hex head bolts. Uh, I also see then something else here that has rounded heads. What are these? Yes, sir, so these are what are referred to as tension control bolts, mm -hmm. TC bolts. Right. In the 120 KSI, that's also gonna be your 1852s, your F1852s. Those are an assembly that come direct from the manufacturer. It's gonna include the bolt, the nut, and the washer. Okay. And that assembly is a package. So when you get to site, you can't take the nuts and put them on something else or take the bolts and use them. That has to get used exactly how it comes. Okay. All right, and this is important. Now, these are special assembled. They have special tooling to assemble these. These TC bolts, we're going to do a separate episode on this. This is going to be a series of episodes, so stay tuned. There'll be a series, there'll be an episode just on TC bolts. That sounds I, really exciting. I, uh, <laughs> this is exciting stuff. Okay, now I see black, I see gray, Let's just talk about the black and gray. So, what, galvanized, plain steel? Yes, sir, and again, everything goes back to the specifications. So for your 125 KSI group, the, in the hex head, the A325, the hex head, right. those are available black, which is the plain you see here, hot dip galvanized, which we've got an example of right here, and mechanically galvanized, which is this example here. Kind of hard to tell the difference between a hot and a mechanical, but the mechanical is going to be a little bit smoother. Okay. The best news about all of the material we're talking about is it's going to have exactly what it is stamped on the head. So you're going to know if it's an A325 or an A490 because they're made to look the same, but you're going to know the difference between the two. It's on the head. Okay. When you get into the tension control bolts for the 120 KSI group, you're only going to get those available either black or mechanically galvanized. Okay. Because they don't want to introduce the heat that's involved in the hot dip process. In the 150 KSI group, the A490s, your only option right now is going to be the black or the zinc flake coating when you're talking about the hex bolts. Okay. There's talk of eventually expanding some of the allowed coatings, but for right now, all of that's available in the table in the back of the F3125 specification, and it's also duplicated in the RCSC specification. All right. So we're talking about a lot of products here. Uh, fastener finishes, we've done episodes on fastener finishes. I do encourage you to watch those episodes. We cover a lot of uh, information, but we're very specific on what you can do on structural bolt. Not all finishes can be put on structural bolting. We did a really good episode on hot dip galvanized and mechanical galvanized. Make sure you watch that episode because that also very much pertains to this. Now, let's talk about the nuts. And uh, I see some very pretty nuts out here, a black and a green and a blue. Those are really kind of nice. What's going on with these different colors here? Well, despite being pretty like you mentioned, <laughs> This I like is the a blue one the best, by the way. It really kind of pops. It makes <laughs> it, your eyes it, dance. It does. I know it. So <laughs> these come from one manufacturer, and the reason for the different colors is because that manufacturer makes both a hot dipped and mechanically galvanized nut. Okay. So you can differentiate those on site because, again, they look very similar. Right. But what's most important that is whatever process your bolt is done, 
you have to also do that to the nut because it's not gonna fit right. Whether it goes on or not, you're not gonna get the thread engagement that's required for these mm -hmm. connections, and you'll never get to the tensile strength that you need. So what they've done is they put a wax coating that number one helps with lubricity, right. but it also kind of helps identify on site, this is a hot dip connection, this is a mechanically galvanized connection. So you know that you're matching your bolts with your nuts based on the same process. Okay, so you, you mentioned threads. Again, if you watched the episode on hot dip galvanized, we talked about that then, but we'll talk about it again here. Hot dip galvanized is a very thick coating. Uh, it's two thousandths, approximately two thousandths of an inch uh, in thickness. And so the threads have to be tapped oversized. What they do is they hot dip galvanize the blank nut, then they tap the threads. So there's, that's plain steel now on your in, internal threads, but that's okay because when they mate up with the external threads, the external thread wraps around that plain steel and protects it. So they're tapped oversized to allow for the buildup of hot dip galvanized. Same thing on mechanical galvanizing. When you're doing mechanical heavy galvanizing, you also have to tap those oversized. So uh, they're, they're tapped oversized and then the uh, lubricant is added and the lubricant must have a dye. Yes, sir, okay. absolutely. Now I've also seen a red. Yes, sir, and again, that's a manufacturer's decision. Um, you'll see blue, you'll see green, you'll see red. You may see some that you don't see a visible wax on the outside because they're coating, they're waxing the internal mm -hmm. threads okay. and at least one face so okay. that you're getting that, okay. uh, that appropriate connection. Everything's got that grade marking on it so you can identify your material on site. All right, very good. Now, I have to cover this because I've gone on job sites and I've seen this where I'll see all of these green nuts, but then there's a red one over here. What's happened there? You got bigger problems than we can imagine. But <laughs> the most important thing, again, and that goes back to the grade marking. So as long as the grade marking is appropriate, not only is it gonna have the grade marking, it's gonna have the manufacturer's marking. Right. So it's entirely possible that everyone did everything correctly and your nuts are different colors. So that's where you need to go identify the manufacturer and make sure that the correct grade and the correct process was done to those nuts to match those bolts. So we need them matched. Yes, sir. Absolutely. All right. All right, so we have we have bolts, we have nuts, and then I see washers. Let's talk about the washers. You only have two type of washers right here. Yes, sir. So almost every structural connection is gonna have an F436, which is a hard round heat treated washer. Okay. This other type that you see here, this is what's called DTI. Okay, uh, DTI, what does that stand for? DTI is direct tension indicator. I All imagine right. you ought to do a whole episode about this. Yeah, we're going to. So DTI's full episode on direct tension indicating washers. They actually tell you what tension you're putting in the bolt. That's kind of cool. So stay tuned for that one. And then only the ASTM F436 is the only other flat washer that's allowed. Yes, sir. Structural bolting. So yeah, it narrows this down pretty pretty simple. It does. Pretty and there, there may be some various configurations. You may see something a little bit thicker. You may see something a little bigger. But it's all going to fall under that F436 designation. Okay. And it's going to be stamped appropriately. So when again, when you get to your structure, when you get to your site, everything's going to be grade marked. So you know the material that you're using and you're using the appropriate material for the job. All right. I have one more question that I'm looking at right here, and that is on thread length. So I've, yes, I've got this, I see some parts that are fully threaded, some parts that are partially threaded. Thread length is critical on structural boltings. Thank heavens that the RCSC thought about this as well. So the Smart RCSC <laughs> F3125, all of your structural bolts, the things that fall under F3125, mm -hmm. based on your diameter, right. you're gonna have a standard thread length. So right. if you look at this half inch bolt, it's got one inch worth of thread on it. That's, okay. a, that's a half by one and a half inch bolt, it's got one inch of thread. All right. If you add a half by 47 and a half inches long, it's still gonna have one inch of thread. Okay. Because these products are designed specifically to try and keep the threads out of the shear plane, that thread length is gonna be standard. So based on the material you're putting together, mm -hmm. they wanna make sure that you're using the right size bolt, that you're not just building up or adding washers, because again, it is designed to do one simple thing, right. and that's to hold the world together. It definitely holds the world together. All right, so the shear plane. So the unthreaded, or the what we call the body of the bolt, needs to be in the shear plane, because that is the strongest shear strength. It's a lot stronger than the, threads, the thread section. So 
critical to know that. All right, we're going to now also then do some demonstration and talk about row cap and pre-installation verification. So let's let's set up a uh, test unit. Let's do it. And let's get that done. Okay, Chris, we're at the demo table now. But first, let's talk about concerns you get phone calls on all the time on the job site. What are, what are these big concerns and what are the fixes? Absolutely, the, the most important thing is gonna be how you're storing your bolts. I, you'll hear me say it over and over again. Do you have to make sure that they're coming to you in as delivered condition? So that yes. means they need to be in sealed kegs, they need to be protected storage, so they're not sitting in the rain, they're not getting dirty. This was actually a thing that we did in our warehouse. I took three brand new bolts, I took them out of the keg, okay. I put one in a can with no lid, I put yep. one in a plastic bag in a can, and then I put one in a sealed keg. Right. And 10 days later, you can already see the difference. Ooh. And that's just normal storage. That's not even talking about dust and dirt and all that kind of stuff. And those will install completely different. And honestly, these two with the rust may not install at all. Yeah. So you need okay. to make sure that you're storing things how, how they're supposed to be done. Because okay. lubricity is gonna be your number one issue. All of this is we're taking a linear force, applying it to this bolt and forcing the bolt to stretch. We're using that threads on a linear torque level to create the tension that we want. And that's all about friction. Absolutely. Okay, so friction, lubricity and friction. Absolutely. Okay, all right. Then tooling, making sure we have the right tools, right? Gotta have the right tools for the job. One of the most important tools you'll see on with every iron worker carrying around is a spud wrench. Yep. Not only are you going to use the back end to align your holes, because you don't want to use the bolt to force your holes together. Right. You want to make sure that your holes are in alignment. Then also, the most critical thing when you start any assembly is you have to get everything to snug tight. Okay. Now, that's a bit of a gray area because snug tight is defined by the RCSC as normal effort of an iron worker. Your normal effort's obviously going to be significantly more than mine because you're a big, strong Texas man. <laughs> but it's all going to depend be. on the iron worker. But ultimately, we can use this in the load cell for the pre-installation verification testing because that's what's going to give you registering that you're getting to snug tight. Because the last thing you want to do when you go to, to tighten your bolt is have to catch up that little gap. Yep. Make sure that your material is snug okay. and in firm contact with it. And okay. that all starts with using the right tools for the right job. Gotcha. All right, you mentioned the rotational capacity test. Yes, sir. Okay, so we know that is mandated on uh, A325 structural bolts that are hot dip galvanized. It is. Now, with the lubricity on the nut. So, what is this test? Who does this test? And what, are, what, are the, what are the results tell us? Absolutely. So, a rotational capacity test is a little bit of a misnomer, and it gets confused because people seem to think that it's a strength test yeah. or that it's a ductility test. Really it's about, will this lot of bolts go with this lot of nuts and this lot of washers and okay. create a stable, repeatable connection? Okay. Will it get to the tension that it needs to get and beyond? Okay, and then let's run some tests. Absolutely. Okay, rotational capacity test, here it comes. Okay, Chris, so we already have our bolt, our three quarter inch bolt loaded up, but first let me talk about this. This is a Skidmore load tester. The gauge on it, what Skidmore did on this, is they went ahead and they, they put the lines on there for different diameter bolts per the RCSE guidelines. So a three quarter is at 29,000, you know, see there it has a red line there, it says for three quarter. So we're gonna go up to that. Yes, now, to begin with, we have our bolt lot number, our nut lot number, and our washer lot number. Absolutely. So we wanna prove that these three lot numbers they go together, they're matched together, they're to be used together, and we're gonna prove that they work. Absolutely. Okay. And that's a, that's a really important point is make sure that you've got all your lot numbers mm -hmm. and that any time you change one of those components, you need to run a different test. That makes because sense. Because each test is for specifically this assembly. Okay, so it's telling us the frictional forces of these lots. Absolutely. Okay, so let's snug this up. Okay, so. As you said, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure that we get to snug, which for a three quarter is about 3,000 pounds. Okay, and just- We're about there. We just moved that dial, it wasn't much. So that puts us in snug, all of our components have come together. All right, let's grab the torque wrench and 29,000 pounds. A little more effort here. A little more.
a little bit more. You're a little bit more. You're right there. Okay. All right. All right. That's the three quarter mark. Twenty nine thousand pounds. Now that we've gotten to twenty nine thousand pounds, we're going to mark it so that we can get to that two thirds additional rotation that's required by the RCSE for a three quarter inch bolt. Okay. So two thirds. All right. So what I'm going to do then is I'll start right here. So here's this mark right here that lines up with with this. Marker plate. Okay, then that would be one third. This over here would be two thirds. So we're going to rotate to right here. Yes, sir. All right, very good. So it's important when you mark these to make sure that the line on the bolt and the nut and the plate all line up. We'll see that occasionally on sites where guys think that, oh, I'm just putting a mark. We're really using this as a reference point, so we need to make sure that we're doing it correctly. So I have seen, Chris, while you're grabbing your torque wrench, where they fail to mark the plate. That's absolutely critical. A mark on the nut and the bolt by itself doesn't do it. Absolutely. You've because, got to mark the surface. All right. Absolutely. Because ultimately, our bolt shouldn't move at all. We're only turning the nut. So that's the what's considered the turned element in this, in this connection. Right. So our bolt shouldn't go anywhere. So when we get through this with the rotation, this line should still line with the one at the top of the plate, and then the line on the nut will match to our new two okay. thirds line. Okay, important to know. All right, this is going to take a lot of force. Okay, a little bit of rotation there. A little, oh, you got a ways to go. I know that I am definitely skipping the gym today. So Chris went just a little bit past it. It's not what you want to do, but it's okay. Absolutely. Because I didn't hear anything break. I didn't hear anything, and you notice that our tension didn't ever drop. Right. So we're up over about we're up about 43,000 pounds. So you went from 29,000 pounds to 43,000 pounds. You rotated two thirds beyond. So that's pretty significant. Now we're going to take this apart. Yes, sir. So we're we're going to log our number here and get to our peak. So that was 42,000 pounds. Okay. Go so ahead and log that down for test so one as our peak. 42,000 pounds, and then we would run what? How many tests would we typically run? So for every for every lot combination, remember mm -hmm. bolt, nut, and washer lot combination. Right. You're going to test at minimum of two. Okay. If we get one that doesn't pass, and, and we're not quite finished with this one just yet, right. but if you get one that doesn't pass, you've got to find the root cause, whether it's a lubrication issue, a storage issue. Make sure that your test unit is right and that you're using the right tools. Then you can retest that lot, but you have to determine your root cause. Okay. So I want to also reiterate, uh, this is done in a laboratory condition uh, where they have automatic equipment that's set up to computers. Yes, sir. Uh, but this is how that can be done on the job site. It can be done on site, and this can be done in place of a pre-installation verification on site. But most of the time, you're going to see this rotational capacity testing done in a lab setting there you're going to have control over your environment and everything else because again it really is about confirming the fit okay let's then take this apart and i'm going to need that uh you need that socket that socket and then those of you who have watched our episodes before and i'll let you do that will recognize this is uh, my uncle mo's cheater bar so watch our episodes you'll learn more about my uncle mo we're going to use this to break it loose because we don't want to use that torque wrench for a break loose. So, let me get that socket on there a little bit straight. Oh, well, this is 40, 42,000 pounds. There it goes. Okay, that's significant. It shows you how much force this thing can take. All right, Chris, I finished the break loose on that. Let me hold it in the back. Yes, sir. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to do a visual inspection to make sure that this bolt is still intact. Okay. So we're going to run it up by hand to make sure we get at least to where we perform the test. If it had yielded, those threads would be spread. Absolutely. It's so, what we call necking, where it kind of spreads out a little bit. There's no thread damage. You're going to do a visual inspection, and that shows this bolt is a pass, and we can go on to our next next bolt with this configuration for lots. Okay, no yielding of the bolt. All right, here's a question I get all the time. Yes, sir. Can we reuse the bolt? It's a bit of a fuzzy question, but with the engineer of record's permission, a plain 120 KSI or A325 hex bolt okay. can be reused with the engineer in charge's permission. If it's coded, if it's an A490, it's just not worth it. Okay, all right, that answers that. Very well said.
In conclusion, always follow the RCSC specification guidelines. Critical, critical for structural bolting. And Chris, it all starts with the steel itself. Absolutely. You need to make sure that you're using the right materials. And with that comes using the right bolts for the job, the right nuts that go on those bolts, that you're matching your surface preparation, mm -hmm. and everything's matching up so that you're using the right tools. And it's so critical to make sure that you're storing that material right so that all everything works just like it's supposed to. It's a relatively simple group of products, but you have to follow the steps to make sure that they can perform how they're designed. Absolutely. Structural bolting is critical assembly. I want to thank Chris Tribble from Worth Construction Services for his input today. He's been a great asset for us on this subject. Make sure you watch every upcoming episode in this series. They're all worth knowing.